Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the um, Farm to School webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about students who garden, greenhouse, eat their garden, produce, produce, <laughs> and compost it, too. Gosh, that word. Um, late in the week and late in my day already. I um, did want to make sure that everyone knows we will be recording this webinar, and it will be available beginning tomorrow morning on LiveWell Colorado's website. To access the recording, you can simply visit livewellcolorado.org and visit the toolbox and select webinars in the toolbox menu. It's also available on our co-host of, of the conference call, the Colorado Farm to School um, website. And we will be providing links to those websites, to the webinar, and to all other resources that are mentioned throughout the course of this webinar. We'll also have some time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. So if possible, it'd be great to hear your questions as we go along. And if you could indicate if there's a particular person your question is directed to, if you could note that. Um, to ask a question, you simply type it in the Questions tab on your on-screen control panel. So the objectives for today's call are to learn how to establish and sustain school gardens in schools across the district, to learn how to use school garden and greenhouse produce in the school food program, both informally and through formal protocols, and to learn how and why to set up a composting program in a student garden. We're very fortunate to have with us a number of folks who've been on the ground doing this work to share their stories. First, we're going to hear from Lynn Kathleen, who's one of the um, managers of the Colorado Farm to School Project, who's going to share some of the things that have been going on more globally. Um, then we're going to hear from Charlie Roberts with the Douglas County School District, from Tammy Westerman, who is with Live Well Bent County, then Beth Schwiesa from Denver Public Schools, and last but not least, from Holly Kahn and Laura McLaughlin from the Mountain Roots Food Project. And then we'll have a few closing thoughts and some Q&A. So again, if, please do share your questions throughout the call. Um, just type them into the questions tab, and if possible, indicate who um, your questions are directed to. We think it's always fun to see who it is that's talking. We won't have these pictures up again, but you can quickly get a sense of the fabulous women that are <laughs> running all this great work. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lynn Kathleen. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, I just want to let people know that the Farm to School Project, which has been generously funded with a USDA specialty crop grant coming out of the Colorado Department of Agriculture, has a lot of different resources for schools, producers, parents, community members, anybody who really wants to delve in and get involved in Farm to School issues. Some of the different types of things that you will find on our website I have listed up here. Um, many, of these, uh, many of these products are actually a combination of um, partners that have put this together. And so you will also see these products on other websites. But you can certainly go to the Colorado Farm to School website to find a number of them. We also have really important links that can help you out. Um, a, 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 a fabulous link that we hope both schools and producers will really utilize to the fullest is Colorado Market Maker. We've done a webinar on that. So if you would like to figure out how to get your school up there as an institution that wants to buy farm to school products, or if you're a producer and you want to sell to schools, go to our webinar to um, see how you go and make your profile for that. Then there is also another really good resource and that is the Colorado Farm to Market Resource. It's an excellent one on regulatory guidelines, food safety, and so on. And then we also have additional um, guidance on crop extension and so on. We have several surveys open right now. One of them is that we want to hear who are those champions out there. And so we know there are a lot of people doing important things. And we don't know about everybody, but we want to know who they are. And we want to profile them on our soon-to-be-rolled-out very fancy website, which will be the same URL. Um, but in the meantime, if you would go to this survey link and nominate a Farm to School champion, we will then follow up and do an interview. 
We also have two other surveys, and you can find those also on our website. And one is our producer survey. So if you are a producer who would like to sell to schools, or you already are selling to schools, this is a, like a five-minute survey at most. It would just be really helpful to um, have your information. You can also choose how you share that information. So um, it won't be available to anybody except internally, if that's your choice. But if you want to choose to. Um, to share it with schools, you can let us know that too. And also, we're very interested in finding out if communities are in need of you know, more in-person kind of technical assistance. And so we have a community outreach survey, which you're welcome to um, put your information in and tell us what you need. And then finally, I want to mention that we have some webinars that are still coming up. And two of them are, one, the next one is on schools that grow their own food on their own, on their own agricultural you know, areas. So schools sometimes have a lot of land, and that land gets underutilized. And this is a whole new movement that's happening. It's very exciting. I encourage you to join this one and listen to what's, what's going on. And then the one in July is on our Farm to School grant template. And this is really to... Um, help schools learn uh, kind of the shortcuts on applying for grants for equipment, food storage, and so on. Here are a couple of uh, websites. I had already mentioned the coloradofarmtoschool.org. I also would like to point you to the coloradoagriculture.com. And what you will find there is a lot of information about the statewide Farm to School Task Force. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Lisa. Great. Thank you very much, Lynn. There is, as you can see, a lot of resources, and we keep adding to them through webinars like this and bringing some experts to you. So our first expert for today comes to us from Douglas County School District, um, Charlie Roberts. Hello. I am really grateful for this opportunity to talk about school gardens. It's something that I've had a really cool opportunity in the last year to be a part of in our district. And as you can see here, I am with the Douglas County School District, and um, which is south metro area of, the, of Denver. And uh, we are a large district. We have um, about over 60 schools throughout uh, the whole county. And so we've had an opportunity in, the, in recent years to um, start gardens at many of our schools. And so as, a, on, as per, a person who's been involved with the program, I've been able to watch our kids grow. And um, it's been a pleasure being part of the garden. Next slide, please. Um, as I've gotten started with this, I run into a lot of questions that people have asked. And you know, when you think about doing a school garden, I've, it sounds like a lot of work. And it is, I'm not going to lie, but it's worth it. And the reasons that we've found that are worth it is that not only does it promote healthy lifestyle and teach us good nutrition, but as a school district, a learning objective that we have is to promote 21st century learning opportunities. And what that means is providing hands-on material, um, interactive uh, opportunities for students to learn about the things that they're learning in their, in their content subject areas. So with the gardens, it crosses both from science to math to writing. There's application throughout all subject areas, and it really does provide a hands-on opportunity for students to learn. Um, in addition, in our district, a lot of students don't have gardens in their own homes. And they, um, they don't get the opportunity very often to be out in the ground putting their, getting their hands dirty and um, learning the opportunity. So it is an opportunity to teach students the value of hard work and patience as they plant seeds early in the, in the spring and put those um, seedlings into the garden and then watch them grow through the summer and, and then have an opportunity to harvest them in the fall has really been an opportunity for that hard work and patience to be taught. It also instills an appreciation for environmental stewardship, which is ob an obvious thing, but it teaches kids that um, there are you know, that the, the land around them, even in their own yards, in their own school yards, is an area where they can be um, where they can be stewards and they can take care of things and, and um, that's a good lesson to learn. And of course, at the end of the day, teaching kids to understand that eating good food with friends is one of the greatest pleasures of life has been a fun part of these gardens. And I'm sure that the list can go on and on, but that's all for, for this slide. So next slide, please. 
at Douglas County School District, in a nutshell, we have um, had a really tremendous opportunity. In 2011, we received a grant um, to start school gardens. And so we were able to expand, high, uh, expand to 24 schools in our district. And each school got um, $1,300 just to start the garden. And that money was used to, on items like soil, garden box materials, tools, fencing, seeds and plants, all the things that just the garden materials specifically. We had to make it very clear that these, the money couldn't be spent on things like programs and curriculum and food um, for gardening days. Um, we, at the district level, provided the guidelines for the garden. And then um, at the school level, uh, we really saw a lot of autonomy at the school level. And there was a lot of local control. Each garden has turned out different. And so the schools were able to plan and design and purchase and build, and build their gardens without um, a lot of, of instruction from us. We just needed to give them the guidelines at the district level. And then just as a final part of this is it has been a cool opportunity to um, bring chefs into our schools is, is in combination with the gardens. So next slide, please. At the district level, there has been um, some very important partnerships that uh, we've brought together in order to guide schools in making their gardens grow. Because we have, um, what we found early on is that there were a lot of questions at the school level that needed to be answered. And so we created a district garden committee at the central level. And this included personnel from the nutrition services department, from our operations and maintenance department. Uh, we had a couple of parent volunteers and also some, we were fortunate enough to have um, a couple of master gardeners that are in our community be part of our, our um, district level committee. And that committee took the responsibility to recruit schools, because we started with zero and now we have 24. And um, we developed specific garden guidelines that we gave to each of the schools. And we were also uh, available to the schools to help them troubleshoot through different sorts of um, questions that would come up. For instance, irrigation. Um, can schools tap into it or not? Um, do, are the items going to be purchased at a central level? Are, is nutrition services or operations and maintenance going to buy a bunch of soil and deliver it to schools? Or do schools get that on their own? So there were a lot of good questions that we needed to prepare for our, our schools directly. Next slide, please. At the school level, what we found worked really well is we had each of the schools that signed up to be part of the garden program. Um, one of the requirements we had for them was that they create a school garden committee. And that committee was, um, was to consist of teachers, parents, principals of the principal wanted to be involved at that level, um, community members, um, just a, a conglomeration of folks within the school community that that would help to, to make the garden happen and would be committed to that, to the project. And um, the responsibilities that we, that these garden committee, the committees had were to raise awareness about the garden at the school and, and enthusiasm. A lot of times it was in connection with the PTO or the PTCO group. Um, and they were to also raise funds to help supplement that $1,300 that we were able to give to them. What we found is, just as an aside, that $1,300 really was enough to get these gardens started. But it's a small amount as um, gardens go for schools. And we um, often found that schools needed a little bit more. And they were able to do that through fundraising. Um, the school garden committees were also responsible for integrating the garden into the school um, through the active, different activities that happen throughout the year. Some of our schools would do fundraisers with the seeds and seedlings or with the produce. Um, and then also with the curriculum where teachers were actually using the gardens as part of their um, part of their day-to-day -day teaching opportunities in the school. Um, I think there's a few more bullet points on this slide, if we can get those up, please. Um, at the school level, the committees were responsible to plan and design the garden. And what this turned out, we had some gardens, some schools that were able to find people within their community who had a lot of um, gardening expertise. And they came up with beautiful drawings and, and um, had 
great designs. In other schools, it was just a pencil piece of, you know, somebody sat down with a blank piece of paper and a pencil and drew out what the gardens would look like and came up with the design. And um, these, the garden committees were also responsible for purchasing garden items and um, organizing the work days and managing the garden throughout the summer. So that's how we were one of the main key um, parts of our success in making these, um, these gardens successful throughout beyond just the school year and into the summer and then out, ongoing throughout, um, throughout the next year and hopefully the years to come. So next slide, please. And at the garden level, at the district level, we created the garden guidelines. And these gave, we gave our schools information about how to plan and design the requirements, the requirements that the district needed. I know in some districts, it's, um, it's, there's a lot of um, ability for schools to do what they want to on their land. And in our district, we needed to make sure that the operations and maintenance department was aware of where the gardens were going to be located and whether they could, um, a school could tap into the irrigation system. And uh, so we, we made sure that schools had guidance as far as what, what they could and couldn't do at that level. We also um, helped to give an idea of what their budget and purchasing should look like throughout, their, um, throughout the the year as they use the funds that they've been given. And we also created some um, templates for them for their summer maintenance plans and their five-year plans um, so that they could help, we could help the schools as much as possible to, to do, um, to come up with ways to maintain the gardens throughout the coming years and throughout the summer. And finally, at the garden, the garden guidelines that we created also included harvest information. What do we do with the produce once it's done? In most cases in our schools, we let the school, you know, the committee decide. And a lot of times, the people who helped with the garden got to take the, the produce home. In many cases as well, the garden um, produce was used in the kitchens, uh, the school cafeterias, to the extent possible. We had a couple of harvest bars, and those are uh, little um, salad bars in our kitchen, in our cafeterias. And we were able to supplement some of the the food in the harvest bars with our with our um, garden, our garden produce, which was pretty cool for the kids to be able to pick it and see it in their own cafeteria in some cases, and then also uh, we at the end of the of the of the garden season this last year in the fall, we had a big harvest celebration at the district in conjunction with the um, with the Colorado Chefs Association, and so we were able to uh, highlight some of the gardens that were used, or some of the gardens throughout the school district at this event. Um, next slide, please. As we did this, we've learned a lot about um, just how to get these projects going throughout the district, how to get um, people more involved. And so I would encourage schools to start small and keep it simple. I've seen a lot of really cool garden designs and people that have a lot of good ideas, but they're really big. And um, some of our gardens that were more successful for, were the ones that started small and kept it simple. And um, and it also had maybe a five year phase in, phase, five years of phases that they were working towards instead of trying to get it all done at once. We also have, um, I also saw that these gardens were a fabulous way for schools to get their communities involved. Um, we got, had Eagle Scout project. Kids come out of the woodwork saying, "We need to, you know, we've got to complete our Eagle Scout requirement," and this was a perfect fit for that. Um, and then we also found that people often have, throughout school school communities, they have um, they have a bag of soil in their garage, or they have an old wheelbarrow that they're no longer using, or um, they've got, uh, they're wanting to give some uh, money to a good cause, or they have a Home Depot gift card. There are lots of ways that people, people want to contribute to schools, and this is something that's very tangible, and that they really, uh, I've, I've noticed that community members really support, because they see the connection of how it works in the, in the classroom, as well as, as, as an opportunity to teach good nutrition, and um, to be able to give something to the school that they know will be put to a good to good use. Um, another thing that we learned with our district, with throughout the district, was making wish lists known. Um, that kind of in conjunction with the last bullet, 
is that as we, um, as schools let their community members know what things they could use, um, what what items they needed for their gardens, what um, what their wish list was, it was a great way for um, for people to be able to contribute again because they knew exactly what what was needed at the school level. Um, there are a lot of grant opportunities, and I, I'm sure some of you have probably seen them. There's a Whole Foods grant. There's um, opportunities through different uh, through your local Home Depots and your Lowe's. Um, we found that um, each school has come up with different opportunities that, uh, as once you get started, they you're more eligible for, and um, and so it's great to to keep an eye out for those things. And then also the gardens have become a great story. And it's not, they're not novel anymore. And maybe they are, but it's something that's pretty, it's, it's, a lot of schools are doing them throughout the country. So it's not, that we're not the first people doing gardens. But they are a good story to tell. And it, it's, um, there's all sorts of different parts to it that can be told and that, um, that has been a really great opportunity for some media, for the district, and for schools, and for even some of some um, some of our students directly. We had one of our students who was a fifth grader at one of our elementary schools who wrote a article. He wrote an article about his garden and submitted it to our local newspaper, which um, and it did get published. And it was kind of fun to see that a fifth grader could write about a garden and get to have that opportunity. And so that's. Um, We'll go on to the next slide now. And finally, I just wanted to explain how we've been able to get chefs involved with our gardens because it's been a really cool partnership. And I would encourage, if you have an opportunity in your community or with your, um, if you're looking at the chefs to school, move to school program, and, and looking for ways to get people who might be interested in working with your district involved, the gardens are a great way to um, bring in the, the culinary expertise that chefs in the area have. Um, we've seen what we've done is we've had a close partnership with the Colorado Chefs Association. So we've been able to bring in some of our chefs to work with our schools to develop from the start last spring before we even planted, they met with some students and came up with a garden theme. And um, that included things like a stir fry garden or a um, a salsa garden or um, all sorts of different kinds of things. And they created a recipe based on some of the items that they would plant in their garden that year. And then they planted them. And at the harvest time, they were able to, the chefs came back and with the classrooms were able to make the recipe with some of the things from the garden. And, and when, when necessary, we supplemented it with Colorado-grown produce. But it was a really, it's been a really cool way for, for chefs to be in the classroom. And they teach students through food preparation and seed planting and harvesting and taste tests. It's, it's kind of got the full gamut of opportunities with chefs. And um, and like I said, the, the demos that they've been able to do this with the food in the classrooms and in the cafeteria has been a really fun part of, of the gardens this year. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to, to talk with you today about this. I'm, um, for us, it's been a tremendous opportunity to see how um, this, the community we live in has embraced our gardens and have made them a success throughout the district. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end when we have question and answer time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Charlie. And we do have a number of questions for you. So I appreciate that people started to enter those questions. And we will do everything we can to have time at the end to answer them. And any that we may not get a chance to answer, we will be sure to respond via email. So thank you again. Next up, we've got um, Tammy Pryor, who is the um, community coordinator for Live Well Bend County. Tammy. Well, so thank you all so much for coming and joining us today to listen to what we have to say. And I just have to say that I, I am so humbled and honored. I, I, there are so many great things going on that many times the, the work that we do seems insignificant, insignificant in comparison. But nonetheless, we're very proud of what's going on here. And I'm excited to be able to share some, some really cool things that are going on here with you today. 
so for those of you who don't know, and, I, and I'm aware that there are lots of um, representatives on our call today from rural Colorado, so some of you will already know this, but to some of you it might be a surprise that rural America is a breed of a different kind. Uh, we not only tend to do things very differently, but we, we are different, and there's lots of unwritten rules of conduct that kind of require things to be different, and if you're not a part of that community, you might not always know that. So it's good to either live there or know somebody who does to help you uh, find your way in this case. And the one really good thing about that is that lots of times things can be done in a shorter period of time without all the official written rules and regulations. And so um, it's, it's really um, important to outline the process and background of how we all got, we got started. For, and um, it's all sequential in its own way. And um, so if you'll go into the next slide, um, what I can tell you is that the, the initial slide, um, grazing and grandstand, growing, grazing, and grandstanding for greatness at Los Animas School District, really kind of outlines how we went from gr taking student-grown produce to the table. So as you see in slide number two, um, the groundwork, how did this all start? Well. You know, I mentioned earlier that um, we're kind of a different breed, and so I think that as you go through this, you'll see maybe even snippets of that through the through some of the verbiage that you read. So graced with different groups, what does that mean? Well, basically, we are graced with strong networks that, that were developed initially to support prevention efforts at a community level. Um, I... Uh, as um, um, an employee of Live Well Bent County and also Bent County Public Health, work, started working with schools to strengthen health education nutri uh, and nutrition back in 2001. And we became a Live Well community then. And um, something else kind of interesting is I also am a bus driver for the district. And so it's great to have those networks built and strong networks, be them whether they're community networks or whether they're um, networks within the school district, are so important for any of this kind of work, as many of you already know. Um, it's really great to be able to build community, because at, at a local level and in a rural area, people wear lots of different hats. And you have to build that importance. You have to be able to show people why these kind of things are important before they're willing to kind of put on a new hat and volunteer or help you out with their. Uh, with, with your project. But um, when we were first starting to build our community, we built them with lots of local coalitions, um, local organizations. There were school board members involved, school administrators, even the superintendent is part of this. Um, we have city council members and county commissioners. And it all rounds out to make a really nice framework for, for the work that we do. Um, something else that we've always felt was very important, and, and I'm not I'm preaching to the choir in that this respect because we have some great guarantees. And by great guarantees, we mean we've implemented best practices. Great way to strengthen and grow any initiative. And we emerged in 2007 with the first uh, coordinated school health initiative. There were only two people who were willing to kind of get on board, and I was one of them at the time. And uh, we got our first funding from the Rocky Mountain Center to, to kind of get ro rolling. And um, it's grown now, and it's growing daily, and it's really exciting. And so what do I mean when I say the guards? Well, the guards are really our youth. And our youth got involved way back um, in the early part of this, um, before we were even a Live Well community, through a program that many of you will recognize called Get Real. And Get Real was the youth movement for tobacco prevention. And that actually helped to continue the growth in support of health education. And it builds the first ever community health initiatives with youth advocacy. And so it was also youth advocacy at the grassroots level. And we found very strong voices in our youth. And we actually have worked with youth to build policy work at the community level as well as at the school level. And the, again, the guards and the youth they're great connections. And they're great at building public will and demand. As you know, youth can be very strategic in what they want. And lots of times, they get what they want. And so I'll try to outline that a little bit more for you. Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide now. 
So growing, how did this all get started? Well, we started with a garden project. And it started approximately five years ago. It was a vision of the local vocational agriculture instructor. And there was a piece of land that was actually right behind the ag building and in between um, or next to also a nursing home and an assisted living facility. And he approached them about actually helping some students who were living in town and who were unable to complete the requirements for the class that they were taking. Uh, one of the requirements for being a, a student of vocational agriculture is they are required to participate in supervised agriculture experiences, experiences or basically farming projects. And given the number of kids that were in vocational agriculture and the Future Farmers of America, that weren't living in town, we had to be creative in figuring out what were we going to do to make sure that those kids were able to pass the class. So the idea of the community garden in our community was fostered simply because of a need. And that, many times, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, but many times that, that's the way it happens here. We have to get creative with leveraging funds and leveraging ideas to make something happen. And the garden project, so it was developed specifically to accommodate those students and was targeted to benefit the less fortunate in our community. And we, by the way, are the second poorest county in the state. And it's a very serious situation. We are having to kind of revamp the way the garden looks like even this year because of the needs in the last few years. So in the summer, oh, in, the, in the spring, sorry, the, the children, the youth, uh, and that's kids grade from grade six through 12, actually prepare the soil, plant the plants, um, and actually tend them through the end of school. And then in the summertime, we um, work on a volunteer basis. Many times that includes student groups, um, such like 4-H, and um, also like summer, summer baseball leagues and um, some athletic clubs. And the past year, the garden manager and the greenhouse champion, who's also the business ad administrator for the entire district, were having a discussion in the garden. And the, some students were standing around. And they were talking about what were they going to do with um, some produce that the, actually the local uh, food bank manager was out of town. And they needed to figure out something to do with the produce at that point in time. And so they came up with this idea that they would take it to the lunchroom. And so here's where it comes in that you know sometimes you can do something in a short amount of time and with, with a little resistance, but in a short amount of time and without laying all the groundwork out and putting policies and procedures and protocols in place. So they basically kind of took a basket of produce into the school food service director and asked, would it be possible um, to put that on the new and improved salad bar. And she was a little resistant at the beginning and kind of said, oh, the kids aren't going to eat it. And um, so they just kind of said, well, you know, it was kind of one of the students' ideas that we bring it in. So how about if we prep it and cut it up and get it all ready for the salad bar? Would you be willing to put it out then? And she was like, well, OK. So they did. And what they found was that it was a huge success. And the kids were quite excited to be able to share that love of gardening and the food that they had grown with their peers. And that's how that all started. And it, it's, it's amazing that it started. And it continued kind of through um, the growing season. And then um, on to kind of the greenhouse project. The greenhouse project, whoops, it's still on, grow, on that slide, yes. So the greenhouse project actually was um, a really cool story in itself because the greenhouse was given to our um, school district by the local food bank in an effort to be able to allow those um, seedlings to be started early in a greenhouse situation so that they could go directly to the garden and so that production would be um, higher and to also be um, <laughs> to speed up the process a little bit. And so um, basically what happened was the, the um, greenhouse was given. But then what happened was after the greenhouse was given, there was no money to fund it. And so myself and the business administrator, who was um, also the champion of the projects, we wrote a grant. We got the grant. We asked if they would um, you know, fund us to 
constructed. The grant was given. We had everything organized. And I happened to be in a meeting with um, a, a member from the Department of Corrections. And his, his wife said to me, you know, Tammy, you really should think about allowing um, the Department of Corrections to, to build this greenhouse for you. And so they left a legacy for our community. And many of you know that uh, that Department of Corrections was closed this year. They left a legacy in the greenhouse that was constructed and ready to go complete with uh, radiant floor heat for the greenhouse. And it started in December. And by February, kiddos were eating that, um, that produce in the, in the lunchroom. So the garden manager actually paved the way for that greenhouse produce to happen. And those are basically our humble beginnings for that. I want to talk, go into, going on to the next slide, gregarious groups. So I want to just focus just a little bit more about what we really consider to be our success projects. So youth as volunteers are, mean everything to us. We utilize youth and as a picture that you see there. We use them for everything from projects to sustainability. And what you're seeing there was a project for sustainability uh, we recently had a big event going on in our community, and we had a parade. And those youth, those youth are involved in both the greenhouse project and also in the youth task force. Um, except for the little carrot there, he was uh, one of our employees' little boys. But basically, we utilize youth, and they get involved and they get excited um, about what's going on in our community. And what we've discovered is that youth voices often hold much more influence and much more water than even adults. One thing that we were trying to do in the community, we used a, um, some youth to help um, help us kind of pitch it to stakeholders. And I kind of gave the same pitch last year, and they wouldn't approve it when I did it. But when the youth brought it to their attention, they supported it. So a great thing to think about that. Next slide, please. Thank you. So grandstanding for greatness. And I know this sounds a little negative, um, but what I want to explain to you is that Youth really are the grabbers. They're really the future. They're really um, what we have to do in, in small rural communities to catch the attention of people we want to fund or people we want to volunteer. We have to do things just a little bit differently. Um, if we're doing things the same way as everybody else, it's kind of ho-hum, and nobody's really too interested. So we like to be a little crazy. And um, so things like the parade with the vegetable and fruit costumes, Great fun for all involved and really a way to catch the attention of the community. And consequently, uh, we actually had a, some big sales for our greenhouse um, in bedding plants and vegetable plants for um, the sustainability of the greenhouse. And so again, the grabber of those youth, they have strong voices. And they're often perceived differently and well received. And they're Things that are previously attempted were turned down, but when the youth got involved, they said, let's go for it. And so the growth, or the process. And this is, I'm going to end with this, because it's kind of our policy that we keep talking about something until it happens. We make it fun. We make it fresh and different. And we make it food. And so remember, if two 2,500 people in our city and only 6,000 in our county can start a project such as this, you can too. Thank you again. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have later on. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Tammy. And yes, everyone, please keep the questions coming in the question tab. And next up, um, we go back from Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and we are closed for lunch from 12 to 1. Please leave a message after the tone, and we will return your call as promptly as possible. Thanks. Have a great day. Sorry. I think someone has put us on hold. So, or. Me one minute. Um, I'm going to transition now to to Beth Schwiza from Denver Public Schools. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Beth Schwiza from Denver Public Schools, as Lisa said, and um, we have a wonderful program going with our uh, school gardens. The school gardens in Denver have been pretty strong. We have more than 38 school gardens run by a variety of um, parents, teachers. Uh, Denver Urban Garden Slow Food. Uh, the, the deal with us is that we had this wonderful produce out in the gardens, but we didn't really have a way to uh, get it into the kitchen with uh, proper protocols and everything and, and blessed by the health department. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through our, um, our little deal here. 
Um, DPS changed from uh, the heat and serve kind of food production to scratch cooking in 2010. Um, the same time that we bought over 100, or we bought 80 salad bars, now we have over 100. And we also started, uh, we developed the um, program to get the garden produce into the kitchen. One really important thing with our um, scratch cooking method was we did a lot of training in um, cold food prep and knife skills. So that helped um, all of our staff to um, take the products from the garden and bring it into the kitchen or into the lunchroom. Um, um, you know, and, and present it in a beautiful way. Uh, procuring fresh local produce meets one of the most important needs in our scratch cooking initiative. And I've got the words whole, nutrient dense, fresh, basic, clean label ingredients. It's very important to us. To continue this recording, press 1. To return to the main menu, press 8. Or, if finished, press the star key and hang up. Sorry, we're having some technical, technical difficulties. To continue this recording, press 1. To return to the main menu, press 8. Or, if finished, press the star key and hang up. So the next slide you see is... Thank you. We, Goodbye. Goodbye. We had to define... Go back up one. One. Yes. We had to define what our scratch cooking um, is. And because everybody kept asking us different things like, do we make our tomato sauce from fresh tomatoes? And the answer is no, we still use canned. So anyway, how we fit in the produce, we have student preference plus science um, research-based nutrition information with our whole nutrient-dense, fresh, fresh, basic, clean label ingredients with our skilled labor on-site preparation so that we can provide wholesome, nutritious, delicious food that students love. And especially when they see the products from their garden that they've been involved with, um, it does increase participation in that. So the next slide we see we have, um, this is actually a garden produce from Steel Elementary. If you're ever in Denver and you go down Alameda, um, you're going to pass by Steel and you can see the garden right there. It's absolutely beautiful. So we had all this produce from school garden. Um, there you can see we added the um, salad bars to our schools. We uh, now have 109 salad bars in 100 of our schools. And how did we um, figure out how to procure the produce from the school garden? Um, First, we partnered with Slow Food Denver and Denver Urban Gardens and other organizations. Slow Food Denver, and especially Andy Nowak, was very um, important in helping us to write the safety, food safety protocol. We went by um, federal and state guidelines, good agricultural practices, GAP, and good handling practices, GIP, and all of this was approved by the Denver Health Department. Um, what happens, our basic protocol uh, goes like this. The food, DPS Food Service and District Garden Leader determines what products can be served in the caf cafeteria or what will we serve in the cafeteria for the next year. Um, we kind of de determine five major things, you know, um, spinach, um, tomatoes, carrots, you know, certain things that would go very well. We, di we take anything that the garden gives, but, you know, let's, we tried to maximize product um, um, produce that would be prolific so that we could really show the kids, you know, that their stuff was in the cafeteria. The school, and we had 15 schools participate in the fall of 2012. School garden leaders sign up in August to participate in the um, garden and cafeteria program and so that they can be trained in protocols and procedures. The garden leader coordinates with the kitchen manager and gets to know them. Um, we only allow and kind of tidbits of the protocol, students have to be healthy to be in the garden. They can't have been sick um, one to two weeks prior to walking into the garden. And so they pick and clean the produce along with the garden leader. 
um, and they and cleaning in the garden is basically rinsing it off. And then they put the produce into clean and sanitized buckets, and they bring it into the kitchen, and we refrigerate it for 24 hours or more, and then we um, clean and prep and proceed like we would with any produce that comes in. We actually buy the produce from the gardens um, in 2010-11, or is it 10-11, 11-12, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's late in the day for me too. Anyway, the first year that we did this, um, DPS paid the student gardeners uh, $1,500 for the 1,224 pounds of produce, and we did it in a big way and, you know, with media and the, the um, check, as you can see here. And currently, we just simply pr uh, purchase it as it's harvested. And how we do that is that when the produce is brought into the kitchen, um, actually, they create an invoice at that time. And then um, they, you know, we that's how we uh, create an invoice to sell. So anyway, last picture is one of our salad bars. And we just um, love this this program and we, we want to expand it actually, you know, from not just the produce that from the garden going into the salad bar, but also we anywhere we can we also put it into our regular products such as garden chili and uh, we have a new product coming out this fall, uh, a spinach lasagna. So, so anyway, thank you and if you have any questions let me know. Great. Thank you so much, Beth. It was great to have that really focused on getting the, um, the process that you all have gone through. So thank you. Great lessons mm -hmm. to learn from. Next up, we've got Laura and Holly from the Mountain Roots Food Project. Hi. Um, this is Holly talking, and I'm here with Laura McLaughlin. And we both volunteer and work with Mountain Roots. Mountain Roots is um, about a two-year-old nonprofit, and for the first two years, we've been 100% volunteer-powered. Basically, we work to cultivate a resilient food system in the whole Gunnison Valley, Colorado, by building healthy relationships between food, earth, and community. And one of the first projects that we took on was the Farm to School program, and we started that in the 2010-11 school year. Um, next slide. So uh, just a little bit of background. Crested Butte Community School is a K-12 school. It has 450 students. Um, this year, we're graduating 19 seniors, but our K through five uh, grade levels have like 45 students per grade. So we're really small, but we're growing quickly. Um, next slide. We're located high up in the mountains. We have an elevation of 8,888 feet, and only about 2,000 people live here year-round. So we're pretty isolated, um, and we have a really short growing season. <laughs> Last year, our last spring frost was on the 4th of July, and our first fall frost was August 8th. So we, um, there's definitely a common myth that you can't grow food here. And for a really long time, only a few hardy people have really even tried. Uh, next slide. So in 2007, the lunch program at the community school was actually canceled because not enough students were buying lunch. And then in 2009, a new food service manager took on the challenge of revitalizing the kitchen, and she reached out to a small group of parents. She wanted her ideas and suggestions for how to make it better, and that's how our Farm to School group formed. Uh, next slide. We started with a local foods day, and we used grass-fed beef from our only local ranch, Parker Pastures in Gunnison, and we used produce from farms in Delta County, which is Mm, 75 to 90 miles away. Um, but those are our nearest producers. And uh, parents joined our volunteer team. The program gained a lot of momentum. And by the end of the year, we were ready to start the school garden. Next slide. So one of our high school students was really the driving force behind the idea of the school garden. Um, this is Jackson Melnick, and he's graduating this year. He had gotten involved in the Mountain Roots Urban Garden in its first year during the summer of 2010. It was a, an unused private lot that happened to be owned by Jackson's dad. 
Um, so our crews converted it to a 2,400 square foot garden. About 16 people were involved in growing it, and um, they donated about 600 pounds of food to the local food bank. So Jackson thought, you know, if we can grow food at my dad's place, why couldn't we grow it at the school? Next. And uh, this is Janae Pritchett. She's a secondary math teacher, and she was also involved in that urban garden. So she agreed to be our faculty point person for the school garden and helped us negotiate the land use agreement for that piece of property on the south side of the school that you see highlighted there. Um, we developed a proposal for the school, and it was accepted over the winter. Next slide, please. So during the winter, it was a great time to plan the garden. Um, one of the most important things to us and to the teachers and the students was that this project was student-led. And so we had some student meetings. And these three high school students, um, Josh Gowan at the top, Rachel Creed in the middle, and then Jackson Melnick at the bottom, they agreed to be student leaders of the garden. We had two uh, master gardeners from the Mountain Roots Food Project who agreed to dedicate their energy to advising the students and the teachers. And then Janae gathered uh, two other science teachers to kind of be part of the faculty team. So working together, that leadership group developed the planting scheme, schedule of work days, and um, you know, kind of everything that needed to be done. So there was a lot of soil amendment to do. That area had just been under construction year before. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, but we had some community work days and we had a lot of turnout from parents and kids and community members. And then the students basically agreed to do a work day a week all summer long to keep the garden growing. Uh, next slide, please. At the same time, Mountain Roots Food Project um, saw the opportunity to develop a kids' summer camp. And that's one of our solutions for um, getting kids involved and keeping the garden growing over the summer. It's very uh, effective and mutually beneficial. So we had 36 kids sign up for our summer camps, and they worked in the garden all summer long as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this just shows the garden kind of in the middle of the growing season. Uh, next slide. So when school started, the garden was bursting with food. And everybody was really impressed, especially the administration. I don't think that they expected it to be um, quite so polished and quite so um, abundant. But it was. And that kind of inspired one of the science teachers to create a new program called BioBuddies. And it just kind of happened spontaneously. It's similar to what a lot of schools do with book buddies. Um, it pairs some 10th grade biology students with underclassmen, and they create their own schedule. They go out into the garden, and they do whatever garden chores need to be done. At that time, it was quite a lot of harvesting. So the younger kids get a lot of peer-to-peer -peer working, and the older kids get to teach what they've been learning. Next slide, please. So the other thing we did was um, we had a school garden week, and we invited elementary classes to sign up and go to the garden and get a tour, harvest some selected vegetables, and then we had a guest chef come into the classroom and cook some certain things with the classes based on what they harvested. So these are third graders. They went out to the garden and harvested 30 pounds of salad greens. And then our guest chef made some balsamic vinaigrette and green goddess dressing with them. And the next day, they served the dressing and the salad for the second and third grade lunch. Next slide, please. So uh, we winterized the garden during October break, and we started thinking, well, that was awesome. What else could we do? Um, so that led us to our composting project. Um, our farm school volunteer team had a brainstorming session, and we wanted to develop some lessons for classroom support so they could start integrating garden learning into their classrooms. And we also talked about composting, and we knew we had to start small with some winnable battles, with some projects that we could actually accomplish. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we did was vermicomposting. Um, that's indoor composting with red worms. 
All 15 K-5 classes were given a worm bin, and Mountain Roots educators came in and taught each class the basics of composting, how to care for the worms, what could go in the bin, what couldn't go in the bin. And, uh, and then those classes were maintaining their bins with basically feeding them with their snack scraps that they eat in their classroom. That project had some mixed results. Uh, about half of the bins did really well, and then other ones got stinky, they grew mold or had bugs, and, uh, or for mysterious reasons, the worms just died. We think that the bins did better in classrooms where the teacher was more interested or where the worm bin had somehow become part of the daily class job list, like being a line leader or a desk cleaner or the class messenger. If somebody had the job of managing the worm bin, it tended to do better. Um, at any rate, that project introduced students and teachers to the idea of composting. And at the end of the year, this was at the end of last year, only a few classes wanted to keep their bins going. And so the high school science classes ended up with the rest of them. Um, next slide, please. So now our high school science classes have six big worm bins going in the back of the room. And instead of using the elementary snack scraps, they get the kitchen prep scraps. So all the peelings and chopped ends of vegetables and things from the kitchen. The kitchen brings that up to the science classes, and the science kids are in charge of composting. Um, right now, those six bins are able to handle the volume, and the students harvest the compost and about three or four times a year, and they take it out to the garden. So then we wanted to take it to the next level. Um, next slide, please. And we knew we had to do it in a way that the school would be open to. So our team talked with the administration, uh, food service staff, planners from the town, uh, master gardeners from Mountain Roots, we talked to the CSU Extension. Um, we talked to the Office for Resource Efficiency. And we, we wanted to find out if something on a larger scale might work. So Laura McLaughlin, she was one of our main volunteers. And she volunteered to take the lead on the project. Um, she did all the research, figured out the ins and outs, the hows and whys, and she came up with a plan. Laura, do you want to talk about how you came up with the plan? Sure. So. I did a lot of internet searching, and um, Holly had provided me with some resources. And the one that I found most useful was this school composting manual that was developed in Mansfield Middle School in Connecticut. And the thing I really liked about this manual is it was developed over time, and it acknowledged the, the mistakes or the things that they needed to do differently for their school composting problem problems like not having enough space, you know, needing more bin space or needing bins for the brown materials that have to go in with the food scraps. Um, and also the thing I liked about this manual is it just really assumes that everyone would be on board and that this was just something that was necessary and a responsibility of all of us to do. Um, when we start talking about this with some community members and things, it seems like a lot of people are pretty reluctant and think, you know, why would we want to do this or, I don't know. But that was just really enlightening for me and empowering to me to realize that there's plenty of people doing this around the country and have been doing it for a long time. So, um, yeah, we went to the administration and they were not ready to build a bin, but um, they agreed to do a one-week composting experiment in the cafeteria. And so we decided to do it the week after Earth Day. And I think it went really well. Um, should I go into our results now? Or? Uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, we set up the project for the week after Earth Day. And we offered to visit the elementary classes beforehand to give them a one hour hands-on lesson about composting so that the kids would get an overview of the theory and be prepared for the project. Um, only, well, three of our third grade classes and two second grade classes invited us in. And um, I think on the next slide, there's an information sheet that we provided to all the teachers. So even if they didn't get our lesson, they had some background information that they could transfer to the students about what was coming up for them in the cafeteria. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
So we had a deal with the cafeteria because they were really afraid to do this project. So our deal was they wouldn't have to lift a finger. Nothing would change for them. We would do it all. And the food service manager said, I want three volunteers every day for the whole lunch period. And that's what we did. Um, they thought the sorting would take too much time and make too much of a mess. So we assured them that we would take all the compost and recycling away each afternoon. Um, the volunteers manned the sorting station and helped the students sort. They had a landfill container, a bucket for liquid milk and juice, a container to separate out their milk carton, um, a recycling container, and then our compost container. Um, next slide. So on the first day, we just made an announcement to each lunch period, telling them how we would all help the earth by sorting the garbage, recycling, and turning our food back to healthy soil. And then we told the kids how to navigate the trash station. Next slide. All right, so um, one thing that I didn't realize going into this was um, the recycling situation or what was going on with recycling. Because when we separated out the compost and the milk carton, um, we really only had a half a bag of garbage that needed to be sent to the landfill if we took out the plastic that could be recycled, the milk cartons, which we can't recycle at this point, but we could potentially think of another way to get the milk to our kids besides using the, the milk cartons. Um, but the composting itself went great, and I think the littler kids needed more explanation and were a little more confused, but the older kids had no problem. And so, yeah, that was the, the most powerful point in the whole week, I think, when the head custodian came up to me and he was like, we usually empty this five to six times a day, and we've only had to empty it once at the end, and it was only half full, and that's because we were able to take the milk cartons away and the plastic cups that the juice came in, and then the compost. So what we realized was that we need to work better with the uh, National Honor Society, who's in charge of the recycling program, and make it more universal, not just a composting you know, system, but um, figuring out our whole recycling process. So we have more work to do figuring out our student leaders you can go to the next slide. And so our next step is to talk with the administration and evaluate um, you know, how things went and how we can make things go more smoothly. And we were able to you know, figure out how much food waste we produced in a lunch period. Um, next slide. So you can see here in this picture, it only has the first three days of numbers on the chart. Um, but you can see all the bags of milk cartons and the buckets of compost, and then the recycling that we were able to put on the curbside recycling, um, which all that took was figuring out that we needed to take the aluminum tops off and dump out the liquid, and then we could recycle it. And that's something that wasn't being done at the school before. And I think maybe even starting this week, they were able to implement that. So that was one of the changes that happened right away. And then from this information, we're going to hopefully figure out a um, more permanent composting and recycling program for next year. Um, most of the teachers and students that we saw in the lunchroom and even in the hallways afterwards came up to us and said, we should do this all the time. And, uh, and we agree. So I think our next step is going to be to hold a debriefing with administration and the food service staff and see um, you know, did they like it? Was it harder or easier than they expected? Would they consider doing it full time? And if so, what would that take? What kind of support would Mountain Roots need to provide? What sort of uh, leadership could students take, like the National Honor Society? And then the, the other side of this is tying the compost back into the garden. So we're going to have a meeting with that student garden leadership team that I was talking to you about. The um, the Mountain Roots Garden Coordinator is a graduate from Western State College. And when he was part of the Sustainability Coalition, they started an industrial composting system at the college. 
So he's going to come in and help our students take the information, this data that they collected, and do some calculations, and then apply it to a design from that Mansfield composting manual. Um, I think I might have one more slide in here, maybe two. Yeah, so this is the design that's provided in that Mansfield composting manual. Um, but there are several different ideas on the style of the composting bin to build, and our town has to be involved because we have a lot of concern about bears and other animals that could be potentially dangerous to have on school property. And they're really only going to agree to this if it can be bear-proof. So that's a major challenge. Um, we've engaged a couple of local builders to help with the actual construction. And with luck, if everything goes well, we're going to build this compost bin on May 19th when we're having a big uh, community dig-in day at the Crested Butte Community School Living Classroom. So we think that um, when students can see the transformation from yucky food scraps into a rich and valuable resource, they, they will be active participants in the full cycle. I'm not sure if I have any more slides, but there we go. That's our conclusion. And we just thank you so much for um, allowing us to share our story with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Holly and Laura, and thank you to everybody who stayed on the call. We've run a little long, but given the number of questions we've received and the um, continued attendance, I think it was well worth it and just some fantastic um, stories and lessons to learn. So I want to actually thank Wendy peters Muschetti and Lynn Kathleen for assembling such a great panel. I mean, this great range of big and small rural and urban districts and the the varying examples that they have to share in the varying um, details, and you can get a sense of the differences and of the power that you have, whether you're in a small or a large district, but there's so much that everyone can do. So we appreciate you sharing your learnings and lessons. And we will be responding to the questions. We'll do that via email, and several of you have asked for contact information. We will provide the contact information for all of the presenters um, when we send out an email. And we do, we have a spirit of some parting words that we like to share each time. I know some of you are probably well into the work of school gardens, and this is something that you are building on and you wanted to learn from others, and there are probably some of you who haven't done any of this work. So we just, we all need to celebrate every success, no matter how small, and keep striving for further excellence. So as you see, we will get to you um, the key resources and all the other resources that are mentioned throughout the presentation and all of our contact information. And um, we will get questions back to you. So thank you so much, and we hope to hear you on our June call. Thanks again.